Hello, and welcome to the 12th truth, the 12 truths of a spiritual path. And the 12th truth is the truth of unity and spiritual renewal. So the universal law that encompasses spiritual renewal and the truth of unity is the principle of mentalism. In a nutshell, the principle of mentalism states that all is mind and the universe is mental. So everything is a projection from our mental state. We now understand that quantum physics, string theory, um, astrology in terms of holograms, everything is sort of encompassed over one energetic field. That energetic field is mental. And the way that we experience the world is related to the way that um, we take in through our consciousness, this, um, this mind that, that and consciousness level that lives in our head or in our, in our mind. So this idea of all being one, the actual unification of everything is one, but we are filtering it through our level of consciousness. So I want to share a story of Jonah and the whale from the Bible. So Jonah was a prophet, a man of God, and God asked him to go to the land of Nineveh. The people of Nineveh had lost their moral compass, and he said, go and preach my word to the people of Nineveh. Well, Jonah thought that he was above that. Jonah thought that these people did not deserve to learn the word of God, and basically God should just punish them for having lost their way. So what he did was he ran away, and God, trying to get him back on track to do as what he had been indicated to do, had him swallowed by a whale. When Jonah is in the belly of the whale for three days and nights, he turns and just goes to prayer, drops on his knees, and he surrenders. And part of this truth of unity is the need to surrender to something mystical or magical that's beyond us. And so after three days and nights in the belly of the whale, the whale vomits Jonah onto the land of Nineveh. Jonas, rem, Jonah remembered that he too had suffered, that he too needed some reminding during, during his own life to, uh, prior to becoming this, this, this prophet or man of God. And when he got to Nineveh, he indeed did, did preach the word and God spared the people of Nineveh. So this is the epic battle between ego personality and the divine will or the self. So this is the exact thing that when we are in a process of spirituality or spiritual renewal, which is tied into this truth, we have to continuously remember who we once were, the ego and the personality, the validation, the wounds, the needs that we wanted others to fulfill in us that led us down a spiritual path, that pain and suffering that we created so that we could get sort of redirected in life and have our, excuse me, our will and our purpose lead us rather than our ego and our personality. Jonah didn't want to be reminded of his shadow. Nineveh was his shadow. He was saying, that is not me. When in reality, not only was that him from, from previous to finding God and finding his way and, and, and being a prophet, but it's the, the meaning of encountering the shadow as you're doing a spiritual renewal or as you're trying to unify the, the world and, and, and find yourself in all experiences. This is also linked to the principle of correspondence as within, so without, that everything mirroring on the outside is mirroring on the inside. He had forgotten that the problem was him. He had forgotten that it was his suffering that led him to God, the word of God, to straighten out, so to speak. And he had forgotten that he has to spiritually renew daily by confronting that hydra or that passion or that vice in him. That is exactly the legacy that we leave behind. 
He also had forgotten that we need to surrender to something greater than ourselves. And it wasn't until he was in the belly of the whale that he was reminded that although he was a man of God and a prophet, he had to always remember that there was something beyond him. So anything to do with the waters in metaphysics or anything to do with fish or the oceans in spirituality has to do with the unconscious. It's a reminder that we always have an unconscious or a shadow that we need to look at, a low level consciousness that can never be eliminated. So any metaphor or symbology of the ocean, of the sea of fish has to do with this. The other thing was that he had remembered the metaphor of the womb, the toxic waters, which is why he didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach to the people. But the whale and being stuck in the belly of the whale at the bottom of the ocean reminded him that there was a cosmic mother or a cosmic womb that was greater than the personal womb or the personal experience and personal emotion and low level consciousness. So he needed a reminder of that. And part of this truth is the choice to be reminded every single day to choose this path. This is not gratuitous. There's always gonna be a little bit of growth in your path just for virtue of being human and suffering and learning some things here and there. But when you actually choose to be a spiritual aspirant, when you're actually choosing to live a spiritual path, part of the responsibility is to confront the shadow and to be reminded of what you are not. So he really needed this reminder while he was in the belly of the whale. One of the reasons that we can actually unify and see everyone and all is one and everyone is one is when we have greatly suffered. So he needed a reminder of this. So this brings me to the final labor of Hercules. It's Hercules and the cattle of Geryon. Hercules was told to defeat Geryon, which was a three-headed beast. And Geryon had cattle, and he was to bring the cattle and bring the cattle into a chalice and bring that to the teacher. When Hercules defeats Geryon and he takes the cattle, he puts the cattle in a chalice. Let me remind you in truth to the truth of desire. Hercules is told to ride the Cretan bull and be taken to the temple of the Cyclops. That is where we learn that our body is desirous. We indeed do have vices and passions and deadly sins. And we have to learn sort of the 50-50 or 48 to 52 to live in the spiritual and in the material and ride the bull of desires. This is the next step up. This is what Jesus indicated, be in the world, not of the world. This is an active choice. This truth is a choice day in and day out to ride the desires and actually go beyond the desires. The chalice or the holy grail is a metaphor for the body. And although it's flawed, although it's attached, although it has delusions and sins, it is still the vehicle or the vessel that houses the divine and the Holy Spirit that is our, our divine will and our soul. And so spiritual renewal and the truth of unity has to do with choosing that which is beyond the flesh, choosing our spirit, choosing our unified consciousness, choosing silence, choosing service, choosing these spiritual concepts in the latter truths 10, 11, and 12. So now it's not only that we accept that we're desirous and we have a low level consciousness, we have impure thoughts and we have a flawed body that's judgmental, but this truth and it's the return home is the one that says, I not only can defeat the Gayron, I can collect the cattle, I can collect my desires, judgments and vices and sins and they can actually live in harmony within my vessel because I'm going to choose the soul over the body, the soul over the desires, the divine will over the ego and the personality. And this has to be decided upon daily. That is with the story of Jonah where he had forgotten and he needed a reminder. 
So this brings me to the chalice and the sword. The chalice or the holy grail, which is where Hercules put the cattle in, represents, as I said, our divine dwelling or our flawed flesh and our body. This represents the feminine nature, the earth and water elements or the feminine polarity. This represents the earthly consciousness. The sword is the masculine and the heavenly consciousness that lives within the chalice. And we have to choose that we're going to modify our ego, our personality, and actually have our will, our spiritual consciousness, dictate and rule the show of the earthly consciousness or the body, not the other way around. The desires aren't going to ride and determine the ego personality ruling the show, but rather the self, the divine will, the soul's purpose is going to um, override the desires. So Jesus said, be in the world, not of the world. And what this means is you must live in the world. Once you go through all the truths and you do a spiritual strip tease and you remove the veils and you identify all of the hydra heads and all of your deadly sins, you are required to re-enter the world. Preach kindness, empathy, compassion. What Jonah failed to do, which was to remember that he at one point was that. So how do we choose unity and renewal each day? Three key steps. Read something spiritual or contemplative each day. Meditate on the teaching, on the passage. It could be a textbook. It could be a sacred text. It could be the Bible, or it can be um, any book that speaks to you in terms of contemplative, you know, getting your mind um, thinking in terms of contemplation about your soul, about your ego, about your personality. The second is to have a reverence to something. A lot of times people are collecting data and collecting knowledge and studying, studying, studying. And I was definitely a victim of that for many years. But I had to settle on something, a reverence to something, one practice that I do each day that participates in the renewal of my soul, that reminds me that I chose this path, that I today and tomorrow and the next day am choosing this path. It doesn't have to take a long time, but consistency is key. And the third thing for spiritual renewal and to always remain unity with others is to remind yourself of your shadow. You cannot run away from your Nineveh. What you introduce into your sphere of consciousness that you judge is there to be looked at day in and day out. In the Hebrew tradition, there's a saying, Emmet Shel Sesed, that says, say a kind and loving truth. You may judge someone, you may see something that still isn't fully integrated in yourself, although you're working at it. But remember that everybody's at a different stage in the journey and not everybody wants to be a spiritual aspirant and go all the way to truth 10, 11, and 12. They may just struggle with the individuation process or managing their emotions, or accepting their desirous low-level consciousness nature. And so bringing in kind and loving truths into the world is a way also to be renewed spiritually daily. So spiritual renewal and unity, truth 12. What can we do to assure that there is going to be a legacy, that there's going to be futurity? What are you currently doing? with your spiritual practice that is assuring that something is being left behind that will keep you immortal, but is gonna help people learn how to live better. There's an anecdote of a college university or a, a college um, a, a cafeteria that is made with like oak tables and oak beams and hundreds and hundreds of years pass and the beams start to wither. And they discover that when they built the university, they had also planted an oak grove a few miles down the road because they anticipated they were going to need to replenish and replace those oak tables and oak beams. 
What are you leaving now? What seeds are you planting now that will give fruit that will be left for future generations? This is also something to consider in terms of your spiritual renewal and knowing that you're here to leave some legacy. In Jungian psychology, there's a comment, a, a construct called telos or telos, which is the soul's initiative. James Hollis, who's a depth psychologist says, what wanted to come through you and did it come in some capacity? At any point, it's appropriate to have a life review, to pretend and contemplate death and where you are in that process and what you're leaving for future generations. At this moment, where you are right now, are you leaving something for another, even if it's just one person, one life to change? And is your soul's initiative actually being lived through the actions of what you're currently doing? If not, this is a really good time to redirect, to let the soul and the soul's initiative dictate and the ego and the personality just sort of hop on board because you need your ego and your personality. We saw that in truth five of individuation. But we want to make sure that what our soul came to do is being um, sort of lived through us in our life. And so when you're kind of doing this, this, um, this truth, do a, a life review as if right now you were at the time of death, that you only had perhaps a few days or months or years left. What would you do differently to leave a legacy, to leave something to future generations, and to make sure that your soul's telos is being lived through you? Thank you.